The heavens are telling the glory of God, and the firmament proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours forth speech, and night to night declares knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words. Their voice is not heard. Yet their voice goes out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them he has set a tent for the sun, which comes forth like a bridegroom leaving his chamber, and like a strong man runs its course with joy, its raising heaven, and his circuit to the end of them. And there is nothing hid from its heat. The law of the Lord is perfect, receiving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The ordinance of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to the even much fine gold sweeter than in honey, and drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is thy servant warned. In keeping them there is great reward. But who can discern his errors? Clean. Keep back thy servant from And let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgressions. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to thy sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Our gospel letter from this morning is taken from the seventh chapter of Luke, beginning with the third, 36th verse. One of the Pharisees asked him over for a meal. He went to the Pharisee's house and sat down at the dinner table. Just then, a woman of the village, the town harlot, having learned that Jesus was a guest in the home of the Pharisee, came with a bottle of very expensive perfume and stood at his feet, weeping, raining tears on his feet. Letting down her hair, she dried his feet and kissed him and anointed them with the perfume. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, If this is the man prophet, I thought he was. He would have known what kind of woman this who is falling all over him. Jesus said to him, Simon, I have something to tell you. Oh, tell me. Two men were in debt to a banker. One owed 500 silver pieces, the other 50. Neither of them could pay up, so the banker canceled both debts. Which of the two would be more grateful? Simon answered, I suppose the one who was forgiven the most. That's right, said Jesus. Then turning to the woman, but speaking to Simon, he said, Do you see this woman? I came to your home. You provided no water for my feet, but she rained tears on my feet and dried them with her hair. You gave me no greeting, but from the time I arrived, she hasn't quit kissing my feet. You provided nothing for freshening up, but she has soothed my feet with perfume. Impressive, isn't it? She was forgiven many, many sins, and so she is very, very grateful. If the forgiveness is minimal, the gratitude is minimal. Then he spoke to her, I forgive your sins. That set the dinner guest talking behind his back. Who does he think he is, forgiving sins? He ignored them and said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. This is the word of the Lord. Please be seated. And would you join me in a word of prayer? 
Well, Lord, help us as we look into these words, as we hear this sacred story once again, as we think about the words of the psalmist. I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts would truly be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Have you ever wondered why there's always a prayer of confession in the service? You know, people come to me and they say, I don't really like that prayer. Sometimes I just don't pray it. So why not? Well, because I want to come to church and not feel guilty. And it's a real downer when I got to talk about sins and sinfulness. And I want to be uplifted and feel good. Well, all I can tell you is welcome to the post-Crystal Cathedral age. <laughs> because the possibility, human potential, self-help movement... That kind of gospel, that's gone bust. The idea that everybody's going to get better and better in every day and every way and pretty soon the whole world will erupt in peace and prosperity if we could just all get along, that's gone into bankruptcy court with the Crystal Cathedral. <laughs> now, you know, I, I studied a little bit about the Crystal Cathedral. It's interesting that no apologies have been made for the hundreds of millions of dollars that people sent, 10 and $20 at a time. That went into propping up the church. I'm not saying that it was a bad ministry. I'm not saying that at all. I'm just saying that no one really said, well, you know, we made some mistakes and errors. They just had an official press release which said, well, you know, things change. People change. The economy has gone south and mistakes were made. But we're moving on. Okay. So I went back to that foundational story in the Garden of Eden. You know, when confronted about their failure, don't do this. They did that. Adam blamed Eve. And in fact, he actually blamed God. He said, that woman you gave me, she did it. Well, Eve blamed the serpent, said, I had no responsibility. He deceived me. Well, public figures picked up on that strategy, you know. They, they know how to do that ever since that time. So I, I started thinking about that, and I recalled it was about a half a dozen years ago, maybe about five years ago, that a, a well-known comic was caught on someone's cell phone camera delivering an incredibly racist routine. He was probably drunk at the time. And the routine then was uh, uploaded to YouTube and went viral, and the result was embarrassing to say the least. So the comic made the, uh, this is how you do damage control. You go to all the late-night talk shows. And he said, I'm shocked by what I said, but I'm really not a racist. You get to know me. I'm really a pretty good guy, and I'm going to seek therapy. Okay. So not long after that, a famous actor, no names now, he was caught DUI by the police. And on camera, he carries out a vicious anti-Semitic rant to the arresting officer, whom I think actually happened to be Jewish. And, of course, that actor went on damage control mode right away, got a publicist, pleaded with the press to understand that he is not an anti-Semite. Truly in his heart, he's not. He was just a little drunk that night, got out of control. And, you know, a little therapy was going to help him too. <laughs> wasn't long after that, a very well-known and established preacher, um, he was caught in a compromising situation with a prostitute. Well, he knows the language of confession pretty well. He understood that. But he said, you know, I'm really not a bad person. It was just my dark side coming out. And if given a chance, you'd see the really good guy that I am. And it will shine through with the love of God. Well, that was all spin doctoring. <laughs> you know, it really was. Now, Adam and Eve and these three public figures, they missed something really important about being honest. They missed the opportunity to see more deeply into their own hearts and to understand something about themselves that if they truly understood it, it would totally change them and for their good. They did not want to look in the mirror that the public held up, that they held up with their own stupidity. And they all insisted that, well, fundamentally, they're really good people, just mistakes were made, errors in judgment, giving a break, they'll do better because they really are very good people. But the public isn't fooled. We understand that part. And the church... Well, the church reaffirms its importance to know how we have to talk honestly before God and one another. And we call that a confession. Now, here's the thing about it. Confession is prayer. And prayer always connects us with God. And corporate prayer connects us with God and one another. So a prayer of confession opens up new possibilities. It's the possibility that we might see ourselves as God and others see us. 
And it opens that possibility in what I hope is the most loving environment where we have the assurance that God is gracious and forgiving and seeks not to harm us and not simply to pardon and excuse it because God took all that in on himself in Christ. It was no small thing. But God seeks to transform us down to the depths of our souls. It's not about feeling guilt or shame that you should be feeling guilt and shame in church, not at all. Rather, it's being open and honest enough that you receive God's transforming love. So now here's a good question for you to consider. Why should we confess our sins and our shortcomings? After all, God already knows all about it. So we go to the 139th Psalm, beautiful Psalm. O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know my sitting down, my rising up. You understand my thoughts afar off. You comprehend my way and you're acquainted with all my ways. And there's not a word on my tongue that you don't know it before I even speak it. That's interesting, isn't it? So if God knows what we're going to say even before we say it, why do we pray prayers of confession? I mean, why? Well, it's certainly not to inform God, oh, listen, there's something I forgot to tell you you didn't know about. Right? God already knows that. Actually, we pray so that we can admit to ourselves what we already know about ourselves, what we're too afraid to say. It helps us then to face ourselves with honesty so that we can step out of the shadows and the darkness and stop hiding in the darkness of our souls, that we come out into the sunlight of God's freedom and find the grace and the mercy and the forgiveness and the peace. Now in confession, we bring our darkness into the light of God. I can't tell you that I sit down and I love doing this. Because when I find that I have been incredibly stupid, it doesn't make me feel good. <laughs> How about you? Oh, when I'm stupid, you probably do feel good. No. <laughs> stupid Bob wearing two color shoes, right? Well, God holds us in perfect love. And he takes those things we hide about ourselves those things we don't love about ourselves, those pieces of ourselves that we wish were different about us, but we don't know how to change, stuff them down and hide them again. And then God shines a light on those things. It's like that program hoarders when they actually look at what's in those places. It's a wreck, isn't it? Like a tornado happened in there. But God shines a light on that. And in his love we actually find we can handle the honesty. And then God uses those things to reshape us, to remake our hearts. And God, in so doing, begins to remake our world and can change the whole world that way. So you have this gospel story, which illustrates this in a way that we don't always see. You know, we know it's about forgiveness, and you probably read the gospel story before. So here he is at the home of a religious leader named Simon. It's one of those I'm checking you out kind of dinners, and so it's uneasy, and the conversation, conversation is very strained. It's not a comfortable, you know, I just love being here, the food smells so good, it's wonderful, it's great. It's, it's really strained. And then a woman comes in behind Jesus, kneels at his feet behind him, and begins to weep, and her tears wash his dirty feet. Well, it was customary that when you went into the home of a, uh, a host, they would have someone there or a basin to wash your feet, and they didn't do that that day. And then she breaks open an alabaster box of very expensive ointment, and she anoints Jesus' feet with it and dries his feet with her hair, and the host is outraged. He didn't have to say anything. Jesus knew what he was thinking already. That man's thinking, this woman is a sinner. I mean, in my house, a prostitute. And Jesus let her do this thing. If he were a real prophet, he would know what kind of woman this is. We don't go hanging around with this kind of people because this woman obviously is some kind of sinner. You can feel the white, hot heat of guilt and shame he's heaping on her. And you know, for his part, Jesus is not embarrassed by this woman. He's not put off by this woman. He didn't say, whoa, honey, you don't touch me. He doesn't do that. He looks at her. And he sees her heart. 
and he sees her honesty and her brokenness, and he loves her for what she does. Simon sees the woman as a threat. What kind of threat? That's interesting. The woman saw in Jesus the love and presence of God. She stakes everything she's got, which includes that alabaster box, which is something prepared for her funeral. She's willing to give that up. But Simon sees the woman as a threat to his goodness, that she is some kind of sinner who's going to contaminate him and his house. He's going to have to fumigate it somehow. But he's really blind to what's going on. He doesn't see it at all. He doesn't see how his desire to be so good is the kind of thing that will kill Jesus, and it does. He's also blind to how he and the woman are connected at the most deep level, that they both need the grace of God, something Jesus is willing to die for in order for them to receive. But Simon's insistence on his own goodness keeps him from seeing this and really understanding what's going on, what's actually there. And it keeps him from receiving the love and the acceptance and the forgiveness and the release that the woman does receive. So Jesus tells a story of two people forgiven, one forgiven 500 silver coins, 150. And he says, so who do you think we more grateful? Well, obviously the one forgiven more. That's right. Simon spent all his time trying to prove to God his worth and keeping things down to a minimal, keeping himself so squeaky clean that it was disgusting. And the problem with this story is, this is the church's story. Because we're more like Simon than the woman. And like him, we're afraid of the woman who washed Jesus' feet with her tears and anointed with the oil for her own burial. And Simon was much more interested in his own goodness that he could not see the love of God for this woman that Jesus has. He needed to see her with God's love. He needed to see himself with God's love. But he couldn't do that because he's trying so hard to earn it and deserve it. And this woman was pretty loose. Well, the text in the message version West read called her the town harlot, a fallen woman. She gave up long ago on her goodness. That just wasn't going to happen. She's been down a thousand miles of bad road. But Jesus doesn't condemn her. Jesus doesn't reject her. He welcomes her as a beloved child of God finding her way back. That's what church is supposed to be. Sometimes church, and I'm not saying this is you, but sometimes church is all about keeping the status quo, keeping our goodness that keeps people out. We don't know how to relate to them. We don't see ourselves connected at the deepest levels as all of us needing the common level of the cross. And people understand that, which is why they stop coming, because they stop finding love in a lot of churches. So it's really no secret why church is in decline in North America, because if it's about keeping our own goodness, just what are we keeping? So when we gather, we pray prayers of confession. Because we need to remember it's not about conserving our goodness, keeping the place neat and clean so we don't have to fumigate too often. It's really about facing ourselves with honesty. When we say before God and one another, we have forgotten the poor, that we've stepped over the weak, that we have selfishly squandered the natural creation on plastic toys, that we lived only for ourselves, when we admit that we have withheld forgiveness to others, that we've ignored the fact that all people around us, all people, red and yellow, black and white, that all are loved by the same God, that when we pray those things in faith, then the possibility opens for the Spirit of Jesus to bring the kingdom of God to us. And it appears as our hearts open up. You see, you're loved by God because you're loved by God. Simon couldn't get that. He thought he'd love, be loved by God because he's so good. The woman didn't know how anyone could love her, really love her, but discovered God really does. That God loved her as God loves you, as God loves Simon, as God loves all of us, even those people we can't stand. And because of that, in church, we can be honest with God and one another and risk those deep and sometimes painful examinations of our hearts and trust that God not only in love forgives, 
but then God uses that to transform. You know, that's the great truth of being saved by grace, that it sets us free. Now, if we are insistent, there is really nothing wrong with us, we're fundamentally good, we make a few mistakes now and again, everybody does, then the prayer of confession is a real downer. It does make you feel guilty and shameful and all that other stuff. But if we see ourselves as loved by God, who sees into our hearts with perfect clarity, then we can be open and honest before God. And we can grow beyond ourselves. And we can love, and we can accept, and we can forgive others. And I believe that would change your life. I believe that would change the whole world. Amen.